Welcome everybody to Photography Insights, the show that goes behind the scenes and interviews people from the photography world. Today I'm pleased to bring you episode 102, which is all about one of my favourite subjects, beer. Mm -hmm. Um, During Covid it's been great to get to the weekend after a hard day's work and relax with a couple of beers. Though obviously you should drink in moderation just like me wink wink after a recent delivery from beer 52 i looked through the uh, ferment magazine and noticed some interesting articles Uh, this work led me to the author behind the work matthew curtis a freelance photographer blogger podcaster and now a magazine publisher it was really interesting to talk with someone who actively has an interest in great beer, but also has the vocabulary to describe this. He can also talk and educate others through his photography work too. Matthew really has understood how to use each medium, like the written word, the spoken word and photography. He's originally from my local area, and it's nice to hear about his roots, and um, how he's travelled to other breweries around the world, and how it's helped him. Matthew doesn't pull his punches with his writing and he tells you honestly about his work mistakes and some thoughts about some of the breweries. Mm. He talks to us about his magazine label Pellicle, its beginnings and how Covid has affected the brand and his life. He also talks about his roots in adult life, how he stumbled into photography. He's now very experienced, works for a few brands and even helps teach others. So in this one we discuss magazines, how to get paid for writing, beer varieties, lactose intolerances, supporting local businesses, Amazon versus online breweries, shooting fruit, learning editing, working with camera, layout versus imagery, pride and the north-south divides. Yes, Matthew eases his way through the random questions, but won't forget about thinking about hitmen from now on, trust me. So don't forget to check out Matthew's unique way of banning daydreaming too. Um, In the show notes for this one, you'll find his links to things like his Instagram, the Pellicle magazine, his own podcast um, with the Pellicle magazine, and his Twitter feed. Now please do um, check him out. If you want any advice, want to discuss anything uh, with beers and ales, uh, please do use Twitter. He's very active on there and he's uh, always up for uh, a discussion or debate. Trust me, there are plenty of them and he likes his honesty. And obviously during the show we mention a few different brands and there are links to some of these in the show notes too, including uh, some of the podcasts he's appeared on, uh, his training event, and obviously his writing for Fitment magazine. I'd also like to thank uh, friends of the show before we go into the podcast. These individuals help contribute to the show by broadcasting this to people they work with, um, which is a very nice mutual thing we do for each other. On this occasion, I'd like to talk about Static Age. Um, Pete's got a lovely book out, which I hope you'll all go um, check out. Um, It's called Iceland by Nils Carlson. Nils is a fabulous artist that takes very dreamlike um, landscapes, but he's also done some some, environmental type landscapes um, involving subject matter. He's a very talented artist, Um, hopefully we'll get him on the podcast um, in the near future. Lovely gentleman, Um, he's on social media for those who want to check him out. But um, I've got a copy of this uh, zine and I think it's absolutely beautiful. And remember he is a film artist as well. Um, So please do check out Static Age, Uh, that is staticage.co.uk. And links to all these people are on the show notes. 
or for anyone checking out the website, they are always at the bottom of my homepage. While we're on the subject of um, the website, which is flogger.kk, there is a article I've just wrote uh, that is all about my experiences uh, shooting in Sheffield. This is uh, very different to my last piece of work. This one's all about um, using a digital camera. So I talk about uh, the idea of creating something new from something old. Uh, many of you know um, I don't shoot a lot of digital. The article's um, more about following light uh, and some of the things uh, that you can do with it uh, about myself and my project work. Uh, and how some of the people have helped um, sort of scope uh, my future uh, and some of the little playing things I've been doing so um, it's not all about um, pristine um, gallery work it's about um, work in progress, about learning and um, what I do behind the scenes there so I hope you do check that out obviously there's links in social media to that article it's always hear, nice to hear what people think of it. And remember, anyone visiting the website to listen to the podcast, uh, you'll get to see extra content there from Matthew. He sent in some photos for you all to look at. There's some of his lovely um, work with breweries. So uh, we may as well get on with the show. Uh, and let's await our host, the lovely uh, Matthew Curtis from Pellicle magazine. And welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. It's, it's really great to be here on this on this nice Tuesday evening. And I'm drinking water instead of beer, which is a bit different. But I've, I've probably had a bit too many beers over the weekend, so I've got to take a break every now and again. That's fair enough. Um, I suppose um, your day job doesn't want to turn into your night job as well and drink all three. It of often the night does. Of the <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I try and uh, take a couple of days off in the week because uh, I, I, the, there is a lot of beer involved in my work, as, as we'll discover. Sounds good. I know when I. I uh, first came across you through the magazine I was just showing you, which was the, mm -hmm. the Ferment magazine. Um, I came across that through, obviously, Beer 52. Uh, I think I tried it last year, uh, and then I tried it this year for myself. And um, I thought the Beer magazine really added something to it because I'm not surrounded by people who try lots of different beers. Um, we're not the sort of people who tend to go to many pubs so this was like a really big insight into what's out there and it's worldwide absolutely isn't it? i mean um the the amount of breweries globally has exploded i mean in the uk there's more than than double the number of breweries there were uh 15 years ago uh way more than double uh but most of them are, are absolutely tiny and, and local um but the, the the whole sort of uh like a lot more a lot of younger people got into to, to beer and uh, started a lot of businesses and it all started in the united states actually so if you're not that into beer you might go hang on american beer is not that great well actually um from the sort of late uh, 80s um a lot of these american brewers that started uh a decade before that when when home brewing was made legal uh, I'll try and keep this short because I could go on about the beer history of the U.S. for a long time. But basically, uh, <laughs> President Jimmy Carter made homebrewing legal in the U.S. in 1978 and unwittingly set off a chain reaction for all these Americans starting their their, their breweries. But they were inspired by by English beer like bitter and cask ale and, and Belgian beer and things like that. Uh -huh. And it just grew and grew and grew. It stuttered a bit in the late nineties, uh, but then in the, uh, the two thousands, it started again and there's over 8,000 breweries in the United States. Now it's mad. If you, if you, when uh, the current, the wow. global situation is over, if you go to the U S every town has so many breweries and brew pubs with it, you know, everything you could try and that's kind of been adopted all over the world but no mo nowhere more so than the uk which is interesting because you've got like two sides of the same coin here you still have a really great 
traditional British real ale camera culture, um, which is really important. But you've also got a very different modern beer scene where where breweries are trying to create different styles of beer um, and and take influence from all over the world. So that's kind of what I do is I'm like a I'm like a conduit. All this beer happens. I drink it all, and then I and then I which is <laughs> great. And then I write about it and I, I photograph it and and uh, I run a magazine uh, about it myself called Pellicle Magazine um, with my friend Johnny Hamilton, who is a, a professional brewer. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I fit into beer as, as I guess a journalist. Um, but it's, you know, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not reporting. It's more like telling, it's more storytelling than reporting. Um, so, uh, yeah, beer and beer 52 and ferment is really interesting because I've be, I went freelance in 2016 and they were, they were the first magazine to give me a regular beer column. And uh, the funny story there is the previous editor said, uh, we'll send you some beer every month if you write a little column for us. And I replied saying, that's really nice, but could you send me a little bit of money every month instead? And uh, they said yes. Um, and uh, na- and I've been a regular contributor uh, at Ferment. And I work under a great editor, Richard, uh, who deserves a shout out. Um, and I- I've just been working on two new features for their next issue today. So and lo- long, fingers crossed, may that continue because it's a great mag. No, oh, that's cool. So is that magazine only available? You through can the subscribe to the magazine on on its own as well. But they, I mean, uh, I will I will say I I don't work for Beer Fifty Two. I'm I'm freelance. I work for myself. But um, mm-hmm. you can you subscribe to their beer box um, and you pick how many beers you want and you always get the magazine with that. But there is a magazine only subscription, or um, you can also read it online uh, on the Beer Fifty Two website. So. Uh, uh, but you generally find the articles come out on the website about a month after the magazine, and it's always there's there's not very many specialist print beer mags uh, in the UK, so it's really great to have something like this that's so well done. Um, it, it's kind of like the music magazines that, that you know I used to read a lot of ten ten fifteen years ago, um, uh, because it just goes really in depth. It chats to the brewers. It goes behind the scenes. It talks about the ingredients. It talks about cities and and uh, places all over the world and the different beers you get there. So it's really immersive. And uh, they've got like when I started writing for them, there was a handful of freelance writers, and now they've got like a quite a big team of really amazing writers, and many of them who have become good friends of mine over the years. So uh, yeah, ferment. Hmm. It's, it's a really great, really great magazine. Okay, no, that's really cool. I, I think um, the magazine's really nice. Um, I think as a someone who enjoys trying different ales, it's nice to hear a little bit mm. of the backstory. And I, I think last year when I got it, it was um, an American brewery, and I think one of them was yep. Clown Shoes. Yep. And it was fantastic because I'd never tried like a grapefruit tart or whatever mm. it was. Um, yeah, it's lovely. what's really interesting about beer now um, is that it's not there. The, there is the, the most important thing to remember is this: the classics are still there. All the great lagers and, and bitters, whatever you like, no one's taking that away from you. But a lot of newer breweries are experimenting mm-hmm. with a lot of different ingredients. That could be as something like hops from another country. So English hops and North American hops taste completely different. So do Australian hops and New Zealand hops. Um, a bit like grapes taste different where they, depending on where they're cultivated in the world. But also a lot okay. of breweries are playing around with with anything they want, really. Um, so adding fruit, um, adding um, lactose, which milk sugar, which makes a bit beer creamy uh, and sweeter. Um, chocolate and cacao and vanilla um, and honestly a lot of these beers I'm I'm not keen on I, I like the classics um, you know I, I like I like yeah. my beer to, to taste like beer as boring as that may sound but um, <laughs> what, what's great though about the variety of beers that are out there is it's bringing a lot more people into into beer because it was seen as, as a very male pursuit um and and i say this you know very self-aware as 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 a man um that um Mm -hmm. 
you know, it, these were very male dominated spaces, not just in pubs and bars, but people working at breweries. But that's changed a great deal. Hmm. Not enough, but it is changing, um, especially here in London, where I live. If you go out for a, for a beer um, in some of the great pubs, it's, you know, it's it's a 50 50 uh, uh, split of men and women. And uh, it, it feels uh, not, this isn't everywhere, but in a lot, lot of places, it, it feels quite uh inclusive and uh and, and normal because it is normal um so uh but the great thing about all these different styles is that it helps people find a, a beer that because a lot of people say oh, i don't like beer i don't drink beer and that just means you ha- hmm. probably haven't found the beer for you yet and and if you do, if you never find it that's yeah. fine i'm not i'm, I'm not of the the stand on a pedestal and say you must drink beer because there's a lot of delicious things out there i love mm-hmm. wine i love cider um and and lots of other things but uh it, you know it it is exciting when someone discovers a beer for the first time um and uh, and realizes there's so much out there so uh yeah no that, that's really uh, you- cool that the variety is absolutely amazing i mean i I never knew there was anything like this and it's been really good for me recently where I've tried things Mm. like beer 52 uh, and I started this idea of um, trying to support some of the Mm. local breweries. So um, I know you um, were born this way. So there's one in Nottinghamshire Mm -hmm. called Pheasantry and that's probably my favourite one. Uh, There's one called, I think it's Mm -hmm. Exciter. Uh, um, and then it's dragonfly, and that to me it's a traditional. Um, but I just find them so beautiful. Um, they're not too gassy, they're not too mm. acidic, and as someone who struggles with um, diet because I have lactose, okay. I'm lactose intolerant. Um, I have problems drinking things like. Um, orange pineapple mm. um, stuff like that so i've got to be careful on the flavored beer as well because it it'll blow mm. me up mm. in essence yeah la- it's, it's this is something that's come up actually uh it's interesting to hear you, you are mm. lactose intolerant because lactose has become like a really popular ingredient that brewers are experimenting with but obvi- obviously that <laughs> excludes a lot of people from 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 trying it but uh, so hopefully it's just a a flash in the pan and and breweries don't get too down that rabbit hole of of that ingredient uh because also it's lactose also stops beer being vegan because otherwise it would be a vegan product but once you put once you put because lactose Uh is developed from cow's milk uh it's it's it would uh, not be uh, a vegan beer anymore and I'm all about beer being as open oh. and, and available to as many people as possible. So removing barriers like that, it seems like it like a simple thing to me. Um, not in the, I don't want to stand in the way of experimentation either, but there should be something for everyone. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I know when I've seen some of these, there's been like um, chocolate flavor and there's like chocolate mm. porters um coffee ones and again like i can't stand coffee um so i, I think you know, i can't eat chocolate you see so some of them sort of flavors i'll never drink and uh yeah, yeah that's, that's tough that's, isn't it? that is very unfortunate i am there are some delicious beers out there but it's also, also there are plenty of delicious beers out there that that don't include uh lactose so there's plenty more to discover yeah, definitely. I think one of the things I thought of about this, um, supporting a local business idea, um, you know, how do you keep that going, though? Because, it, you know, you could go along the lines of supporting your local pub, but I'm not um, I'm not a frequent pub goer. I don't know enough people to go sit in the pub with. Um, it would have to be sort of like a special... Uh, event or mm, mm. something like that i mean how do people fit this in it's, now it's tough especially because um you know supermarkets make things convenient and a lot of people don't want to spend too long out of the house at the moment i'm very lucky where i li- live yeah. i live in a part of london at the moment called crouch end only for another month because i'm moving okay. to manchester uh with my partner diane uh 
in four weeks time which is very exciting i'm looking forward to getting Ooh. back to the north but i have lived in london for 15 years and i'm very lucky in crouch end that there's a lot of independent shops that are really good so there's several green grocers fishmongers bakers butchers really great produce and i don't go to them all the time because they're more expensive and and uh but the, the quality of product they do is is great. And in the case, I, the one I do go to every week for a loaf of bread is um, Dunn's, my local baker's, um, which just does, does fantastic bread. And it's not that, that expensive. It's, you know, a few pence more for, for much, much higher quality. So I'm lucky that I've got hmm. that in in walking distance. It's an advantage of living in in a big city. Um in terms of beer and in terms of what's happened just in generally, I think the internet is is crucial to to so much of this. I mean, in terms of in terms of beer, there's a yeah. lot of um, what we call them bottle shops. I guess you would call them off licenses previously, but bottle shops, which is a term that came out of um, Australia, mm. I think, um, but is generally a term for a for a modern beer shop that has a big selection. And Lincoln, uh, where you are, uh, has a great one at the right at the base of steep hill called the crafty bottle um and uh, i always pop in there for a few beers when i come back to lincoln to see my mum um and i i i I usually nip into the straight and narrow opposite actually for a beer what one thing that is an an advantageous Mm -hmm. of my job is is uh, i've become quite used to to just traveling on my own and nip and going for a beer on my own which is probably not a normal thing for a lot of people but in in beer that that Mm. that sort of i can remember years ago i used to be quite anxious at doing such a thing but now it's not even a second thought if i just see a nice pub i go and well this is before before covid obviously but uh, if i I saw a nice pub uh, i just go in and sit and 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 have a beer and take it all in uh, because that's all part of the experience that i write about but in terms of going back to your question in terms of supporting small businesses i think it's you know Something that's really evident to me is that that uh, you can't be expected to spend your money on the top dollar premium product all the time, and a great beer is really expensive. But if you can allocate, if you if you love your beer, mm. you know, consider allocating what you would have spent in the pub uh, before it was going to the pub was perhaps more more difficult, like it is now, and spending that on some nice beers and mm. um, and and going online and and uh there's loads of great independent shops online and you can you know you can do this with with almost anything these days you know with with your veg boxes and and stuff and i think it's supporting local is difficult but uh, you know it, when you support a local business you're investing money directly back into the the economy around you uh rather than just letting it go mm. into the ether and then if you think about it on a bigger picture um you know there's there's a lot of these big corporate corporations like amazon i try and avoid using amazon because um they're not paying yeah. uh the, the full rate of corporation tax because of the way the business is set up um and and that means that hmm. if you're spending your money there that most of that money is that's not going to come back into your economy but if you shop local you can be confident that all of that money is going to go back into your local economy because it's as well as all the tax going into the local tax system, the people who work there's wages, they're going to spend that locally too. So um, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for, for small businesses, you know, and there's, and I've got a lot of friends who own small beer businesses uh, and breweries are the same. Um, and that, it, you know, it's a real struggle for them at the moment. And any, any sale uh, is, is a bonus, but in a lot of the breweries, uh, um i mean a great example of where i'm moving there's a brewery called cloudwater that are very popular and they moved to to di- to direct online yeah. sales at the start of the the lockdown and um cuz you know a lot of these these places were selling draft beer and they 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 couldn't pack they couldn't sell kegs of beer and casks of beer into pubs anymore because the pubs weren't open so they started selling bottles and cans online mm. and this has been uh, huge for the breweries that have been able to do this uh not not every brewery is set up with the right equipment to 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 package in bottle and can in house but the ones that are they actually probably saw a bit of an uptick in 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 that in those sales because people were wanting to buy beer to drink at home um so i guess if you're reading a magazine like like ferment as we talked earlier in the magazine i run um pellicle 
um, then you'll be able to read about the kind of of uh, beer businesses, the breweries, and and the bottle shops, and 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 the pubs that are local that that do need your support. And uh, uh, you know, saying what I said earlier, it's in, you know, it's important to help out where you can and within your means. You should never feel forced though to to just go and spend all your money at these places. But you can if you want to. And I I have to confess, I do regularly, which is why I'm always skint. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's fair. Come on. Well, I think that there's like a couple of arguments. Like, for instance, one thing I see is mm. people like Brewdog. Um, you know what they're doing is great. Uh, they advertise on Facebook and things like that. And the amount of stupid comments you get off people that are, oh, it's so and so pound in uh, Morrison's. Well, yes, it is because they buy in mm. such bulk and probably don't give much money back to Brewdog. Uh, I would. Uh, Brewdog's an interesting one because uh, they are mm. they are technically the largest independent brewery in the country now, and and I I've known that because wow. of my work I've known them since they were a much smaller brewery, and um, they serve mm. like I think it's important to recognise that 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 Brewdog is a very big company. It's multinational. They've got breweries in America, Germany, and Australia. Uh, as well as brew pubs here, one in London, they've got one in Dublin. You know, they're 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 a big hmm. company, um, but they do they do a lot of things to like they're doing um, uh, a, a showcase because they've got fifty five bars in the country or probably more than that now, but they're showcasing the smallest wow. uh, up and coming new breweries in in uh, by giving them space, and a lot of big breweries don't do that. And um, I've I've had my fallings wow. out with people who follow me online will know I've had my fallings out with 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 Brewdog uh, over the years. Um, and I've but I've I also like in 2016, one of my first articles as a full time professional writer was about them. And that was that was quite a nice article. Um, so. Yeah. I've had an interesting relationship with them at the moment. You know, I think they've been responding really well to the, uh, to the lockdown. It's been difficult for them because they've got, you know, thousands of staff um, and uh, some of the initiatives they've done, like they're planting uh, a a huge forest, uh, I think 2000 acres or something. Uh, um, I said that off the cuff. So forgive me if that's incorrect, but they're planting a large forest Mm. to um, they're actually a, a carbon negative company making beer with uh, using wind power to power their brewery in uh, Aberdeenshire. Um, so things like that have been, have been really positive and they all, they also come out in support of their, their fellow small brewers because they know where they came from. It was only, they started in 2007 and uh, yeah. they make a product, their, their main product, their punk IPA and, and uh, their other core brands they are an interesting bridge now between, I guess, what you would call really specialist beer, craft beer, uh, micro brewed beer. Yeah. Call it whatever you, whatever you like. It's all they're all meaningless terms, um, but I would call it I would call it craft beer because that's a great way of describing sort of a modern, high quality product. Um, and and hmm. their beer is some probably a little bit more expensive than the big brands like your Stellas and your Carlings, um, but it's quite a bit cheaper than some of the smaller breweries because they've got economies of scale on their side on their side they can make it can make a mm. lot of beer whereas most small breweries it's all manual uh, they they can't buy ingredients in bulk um it costs beer costs mm. a lot of money to make and the, and uh that's i mean that's another podcast episode entirely but brewdog brewdog's an important brand <laughs> and um anyone i know is listening to this going like oh you've changed your tune because i've been quite negative about about them in the past but uh you know i spent a lot of time thinking about these things because it's my job and at the mm. moment i'm sort of pro- i sort of i've made peace with what brewdog do and where they sit in the market um the only thing i worry is when a smaller brewery tries to chase that kind of price point and the supermarkets that they do because uh, uh mm. it's it's such a risky strategy uh you know you, you'll see brewdog in the supermarkets forever that you know they're here to stay but some of the smaller brands that that you might see alongside them now I, who who knows you know the supermarket listings are fickle um so mm. uh it, it, which again comes back to supporting supporting local supporting direct when you can uh because you, you know where, mm. where your money's going and who it's supporting 
Uh, but uh, I think I think that answers your question. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's cool. I mean, obviously, what you do um, is an important element of getting information out there to people. I mean, obviously, you, you've got your writing side. Um, you've now got your own magazine. You're doing your own podcast. And you're a photographer as well. I mean, you just greedy. <laughs> yeah, a- absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, um, when it when I started, I wanted to be a writer. I I I, I always enjoyed writing, uh, even before I I knew yeah. and I realised ah I I would like to do this for a living because when I was writing blogs about different subjects before I started writing about beer in about it was January two thousand and twelve. I started a beer blog called called Total Ales. Mm. Um, and I, I wanted to, to write and, but I never considered writing as a career because I, y- how do you make it pay? And, you know, now I do it, it's still, yeah. you know, I'll explain how I make it pay, but, um, it like at the start, that was never my intention. I just needed an output for my hobby. But when, um, I, you know, I started working for ferment, I started writing for a, a publication in the U S called good beer hunting based in chicago and in order to Mm -hmm. there are there are a lot of great established beer writers out there uh, who've become friends and mentors just to name a few adrian tierney jones pete brown and melissa cole they've been doing this a bit longer than i have and they they're um Mm -hmm. yeah great friends and, and advisors um but uh i wanted to make myself stand out and so i invested in some in i some photography equipment um and i started using the the sony mirrorless uh cameras and uh and then invested in some lenses and started um i was always into photography uh and and so just started experimenting with sort of reportage street photography turning up at breweries and saying can i take some photos of you making beer rather than just photos i've always wanted to avoid cliche in photography so i i wanted to sort of like give a a bird's eye view of the brewery floor that was my initial idea and that and that took off um i i just it just that's something that i picked up quite quickly and i would i would by no means call myself an expert but i've been doing the photography um for about f- six years now so not that's not that's nothing really but i just invested myself really mm-hmm. heavily in in my practice especially uh not the, the sort of shooting and the framing of shots came quite naturally to me but where i spent my time uh was um in the edit and and learning my software and studying mm-hmm. uh what techniques people use to make photos really pop and i think that's sort of like the difference i started to consider uh photos like i would a paragraph in an article like how do i make this how do i get my point across uh, as succinctly as possible and how yeah. do i draw it's all about drawing attention to to the key details isn't it so with photography mm. it became i wanted to have this bird's eye view of the brewery floor and and it did in the early days when i was trying to make a, a break and get commission to write paid features being able to say i can take my own photos um was a bonus and uh and you know throw a few yeah. photos in and that and that that like my writing evolved from from blogging into professional writing so too did the photography uh when a couple of breweries i think uh, there's a brewery in london um a few years ago it would have been about five years ago they approached me and said we'd like some advice on photography matt because we really like your photos what should we do to take better photos and i replied well you could pay me to take some <laughs> or ever the entrepreneur. <laughs> and so they, they did hire me to, to, to come in every few months and do some sort of photos of the staff and, and photos of the beers and, but also photos of people making beer on the brewery floor that they could use on their website, on social media. And, um, you know, I can't speak highly enough of, of transparency and giving, you know, say supporting local, show them what they're supporting. If you, if you can yeah. see, the people like working hard making something it becomes so much more tangible and so much more real and uh and that's that's where the joy of the photography came out so it's interesting because photography started as as a hobby uh to support then it became a sort of support of my professional work and now it's 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 fully 
integral and it's led me to the the big project i just got signed up to do um last month was uh, so i'm doing my my, my uh, first big book and it's for camera the campaign for real ale they have a publishing wing and it's called modern british beer is the working title and uh, it's it's a series of short essays on on important beers that have shaped where british beer is now but i'm doing all the photography for it too and i've got to visit 80 breweries which which is which is all right uh, uh i mean wow i've been to something like 800 to 1000 breweries around the world uh, through my work but um uh yeah to to do that and then submit you know a lot of words by the end of march that's my big task now um so that'll oh. be nice to to have a to to you know i've i've got the the magazine stuff the regular columns which is like my bread and butter that that keeps me in 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 hmm. rent and and food but uh, a big project like this comes along and it's it's not just i mean it it's a paid opportunity it's great to work on that but it's also uh, to to work on something that size and then when you know i I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but to think, oh, I'm going to have this uh, uh, this this big book with my name on the front of it. That's it. That's a really exciting prospect. Uh, uh, so mm. that'll be out. Uh, Modern British beer. Uh, that'll be out. Assuming I hit my deadline, uh, and I, and one the reason I managed to do this for a living is I'm quite good at hitting deadlines. It's really important if you want if you work for someone and yeah. and you file it on time they will probably ask you to work for them again <laughs> that's uh, that's really important um but um yeah around this time next year uh i should have a couple of books out a little guide cool. little guide to london pubs i've been working on and uh, and this big this big book too so again like you said i'm greedy but you you, you didn't know how far that was that was going but but it, it, I think <laughs> th- that greediness comes from the fact is I'm I'm freelance. I work for myself, and I have a very weird job. A lot of people say, "Oh, you have the best job in the world, tasting all these beers." And you know what? I, uh, I that is, I have my dream job. Uh, I love beer. Um, like um, it's my obsession and fascination. Uh, mm. the, the whole process from the farming to growing barley to growing hops to 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 fermentation and with brewing and fermentation and into the sales and the marketing side of it, um, to the drinking it, it's it, every stage of it is fascinating, but as a free covering that as a writer, uh, you've got to, you've got to cover all your bases. So by doing writing photography, uh, the podcast for, for Pellicle as well, it kind of covers all these bases. I'm kind of selling myself. And by, by doing that, I'm able to get enough, uh, regular work, uh, to to make it into a, a a job it's not it's not a profitable job i you know i i used to work in distribution not not in beer before i worked in um in in my current job and it, it, if i'd stayed there i'd probably be making quite a bit more money um but um yeah. you know it's uh the the freedom of uh, working for myself uh is which i think a lot of people are probably discovering at the moment and have, working from home and having that that getting out of the sort of commute in the office life um it, it's quite liberating and and that's that's you know if the great thing is well when travel was allowed to be able to like say right i'm researching this and there's this thing in america this event that's happening so yeah i can afford that and i'll, I'll go to that and research some stuff and i'll get some interviews and i'll meet some people and and that's that's kind of where where i was i mean if if things had gone on as, as normal, I'd have been, I'd probably been by this time of year, I've been to America a couple of times. I was going to go to Copenhagen and the Czech Republic and all of these lovely places, which, which one day I'll be able to go to again, just not right now. So, and, and as you said, I'm greedy because I've been hogging the airtime for quite a few minutes now. <laughs> you, yeah, but obviously <laughs> you've got me talking about beer, which is my, my favorite subject and freelancing, which is my second favorite subject. No, that's that's really nice because it your passion um, obviously comes out in your words. It comes out in your photography uh, and um, your writing. So it, it's thank it's you. Really nice. Yeah, it's it's it, yeah, it's it's um, a real uh, it's a real privilege to 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 do this this work. And it's really great when I hear people like you say, oh, "I really enjoyed that article," because uh, my pers- my perspective is when I finish an article it's filed and I've got to find the next mm. thing that's going to, going to earn money. It's, it's, you know, it's, yes. it's a, 
it's a job to job economy so what sometimes i don't mm. know when things are coming out and 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 uh keeping up with my own workload but it's so it, when someone does turn around and stops and says oh that was i really enjoyed this it's it's a really great feeling yeah i think that's um common in all blogging to be honest when you get that sort of feedback and mm. i'm the same you know i've blogged for um since i left uni about eight years ago um, and then it turned into photography recently and um, i just find it adds to what you do um whether it's an explanation and you know it's more of a guide of how to do something or whether it was about an experience you had or whether it's just um a gallery mm. on some that they all provide different things yeah don't absolutely they? absolutely it was interesting what you said about um taking a picture you you're seeing it as a way of describing something so f- for you when you're writing for other people does your imagery does the wording they put in complement your image or do you have to take an image to complement their writing i think it's a sort of a a mutual process i mean i think i can explain this really well because now i run pellicle that that's a that's a very different Mm. uh experience for me as 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 it's as the editor uh editor-in-chief because when you're a writer you you come up with an idea you pitch it to an editor and they say yes or no and hopefully they say yes because that means you've got a chance to to do some to earn some money but also to do some good work and uh and make something that people are going to appreciate uh reading um Mm. but what so flip that around and now i'm the editor and people send me ideas and it's quite advantageous coming from a a writing background because I, i i with pellicle i have a very strong idea of what i want and so I hate turning down pitches, but, you know, I get a lot. And I, unfortunately, we're, we're a small publication uh, with, a, you know, we're self, mm. self-funded self and uh, funded by our, our readers who, who choose to do a voluntary uh, subscription every month. And, and um, yeah. so I have to make sure I'm putting content that A, I, I would enjoy reading. That's the first question. And then I have to also consider all the people that read the site like will will they will this engage with our readership so we we have to find some sort of consistency and and familiarity in in our narratives so to speak and that and so when i was writing i was able to offer my own photography so when i'm say i was writing a profile of a, of a particular brewery i would go down with my camera and my notepad and i'd come back with all of the information i needed so they were they would they would complement each other but when i started commissioning work mm. for for pellicle sometimes i'd hire a writer and they're like oh i don't i don't take photographs and so i'd have to th- had to have to think well i need images and something that helped with my own photography is i've i started to consider uh, the images as editorial and I, and I find a lot of the time sometimes images can be uh, especially in a lot of mainstream publishing uh, uh, the, the the image can be the, the sort of afterthought um, like, like let's get the story get yeah. the words and then we'll we'll figure it out and I and I and I don't want to really compromise on on both because for me the whether we get an illustrator to 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 draw or paint something up for us or or we get a photographer to shoot it um that that mm. the narrative that they do is is uh as just as important generally though process wise the words will come first and then we will send the person we, they'll they'll have a draft of that article when they go to 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 take the photographs or or if they're illustrating not always though uh, sometimes you're on a short time span yeah. so this is where communication comes into it and a good pitch will give you a good angle and then you can relay that to to a photographer or one of my favorite things to do some of the articles we've done on pellicle is we've had a writer and i've gone ah this photographer would be really good and then you put them in touch and they go to do the visit together so they get to talk about it and direction and and uh, and share work as they're working on it and that's really you know that collaborative process is really great to see um so uh 
and you know what that's really tough at the moment because of of because uh, of covid and and uh yeah but um you know i've you know i've been gradually getting out there and visiting places again um and uh and uh you know generally play, like breweries are pretty so you know socially distant places anyway the breweries are full of very dangerous things like like boiling liquids and chemicals and and cleaning agents and and uh, high pressure gases and so you generally stay away from from things while while you're on a brewery floor um so um yeah that i think that it, it's um i think the important thing is uh, the to con- always consider both um they complement each other like for me they both form part of a, a narrative structure and if you if you nail them both if you get them both right you, you create a far more compelling story and and uh and uh it, you keep the reader engaged all the way through which is the real challenge because in today's sort of instagram twitter world people have got seconds of attention span so when we're putting out you know two thousand word articles you know how how are you yeah. going to ensure people are going to read past the first paragraph and great writing obviously yeah. but if you've got some some strong images in there as well you know they're hooked and it keeps keeps them uh reading till the end so that's that's why it's so important just to keep that engagement up yeah i i think um a lot of that's experience i mean i did um my, my first group shoot with a, a couple of models um june july time let's say and um i, I i'm a film shooter so i literally only shot film so I took probably 16 exposures mm. and that was it. So you imagine that's quite a slow pace. It means people stood around for quite a while. I've done my photos. That's right. What do you want to do now? Um, and what I did was decided to only show three photos online. And then I got people to read my blog article I wrote mm. about it. And it was sort of like a hook of here's three nice photos there's a lot more on my website. I'm talking about COVID and how um, nervous I was um, about meeting people again because, uh, like yourself, I've been working from home and I've literally not been out of my house other than fresh air with my daughters. I don't go near supermarkets. I haven't been near any mm. shops. So for me, it was a lot scarier than I've ever mm. been in my life. Yeah, I I went through a, a, a so I had I had uh, I probably had COVID in in March. I was very poorly uh, with all the symptoms, oh and that and you you know you'd think oh, I've had it. I've probably got a bit of immunity, but that's not that's I I I worried about the possibility of giving it to other people or you know I didn't know anything about it. And uh, when I got it in March, there was you know I tried to get a test and they said no key workers only and unfortunately beer writers are not key workers <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah if you if you read the list of symptoms even the loss of smell and taste i had everything and i was quite poorly for about two weeks not 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 fortunately not poorly enough to have to go to hospital but it made me very very i think anyone who's been in fact had a friend or or have been affected by it themselves are the probably the most cautious people because they know how nasty it is um and hmm. uh and and you become more cautious and and this is so you know i was a i'm a pub person um i i, I mm-hmm. you know I, I i spent a lot of time out and about uh, you know i live in london great big city with so much going on and um you know on a friday i would love to hopefully finish my work and then just like jump on the tube and i go but i'd like to go somewhere like hackney uh for some beers where you know there's a favorite pub of mine and you know what i've not been since since july the 4th when it reopened uh but the, the pembury tavern in, oh. in hackney I, I would love to go there they do like really great pizzas The 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 chef there rachel is just just does amazing amazing pizzas the beer is from a local brewery the five points who we used to do a bit of photography for and it was just such a great vibe all the locals there on a friday it's buzzing and i think i've not been because i'm scared that it's you know i've been going to the pub and i've i've ordered on apps and uh and it, it, it's it's and you've got to check in and it i'm not used to it yet <laughs> and i'm gradually i'm calling it finding my pub legs again because uh it, i miss it and mm-hmm. and I, I don't think i've been to this particular pub 
the Pembury because I've got a sort of cemented in my mind of what it was like before lockdown. And I want that. I want to go there and just see all my friends and and be hugging and drinking pints and, and just having a good time. And I know if I go now, it'll be set at a table, um, get the app order. You know, you've got, you've got two hour booking at your table. You know, what if they have, what if I don't have a booking? Sorry, we've got no room. We're fully booked. And they, you know, half the tables are, are, are gone so it, it's it's a very surreal uh environment and adapting to that change has been uh has been difficult and now we're obviously facing you know bolton's on the news today because uh it's pretty pretty much gone into yeah. to lockdown and uh it's it's okay <laughs> we're helpless we, we, you know we just got to wait and see really it's it's uh you can do right by each other and try and be, do social distancing and, and uh, all that. But, and, you know, I am, and it's, it's a shame why I've not got back to Lincoln and, you know, my mum's in her sixties and I'd love to be able to, you know, jump on a train and come see her, but uh, she's not had it. And I, you know, mm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare risk it. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation and it, it, you know, it made my job very very difficult you know at the start of lockdown i was like well how am i going to how's this going to carry on am i going to be am i going to have a job at the end of this like a lot of people thankfully i was uh, you know I, yeah. I, i've got a, a lot of good editors and regular work and my own website and i was able to just trundle along and um and keep going and things are, are back to normal now uh, in terms of my work uh which which is great um and and in terms of getting out there it's just i'm taking it one day at a time uh, some you know if I, uh, so um uh, on uh, friday last week um i thought right i i, I always just spend friday uh on my own and uh, diane will come home from work and uh, we we haven't got kids we've just got a cat so we would just watch telly maybe order mm-hmm. some nice food in because a lot of the restaurants are doing delivery now and and we'd have we'd we'd put our feet up on a Friday, but this Friday I was like, right, I'm going to get out. I'm going to go for for a walk, and it only takes me 25 minutes to get to Central London uh, on a train. So I jumped on okay. the train, and the, and the, oh, there's a lot of overground trains as well. So I didn't have to go didn't have to go on the yeah. underground. I went to Finsbury Park and got the train to Blackfriars Station, which is right on the river, and then I walked along the South Bank and. If you've not been to London before, the South Bank is a very touristy area and it has street performers and it has loads of bars and restaurants. Uh, and it's just and there's people doing exercise, running and cycling up and down it. And you've got things like the Globe Theatre and the Tate Modern and the South Bank Centre. So very, it's a cultural hub for, for London. And uh, I went and there, it was it was like a ghost town. It was like maybe one fifth of the normal amount of people. And and I was walking around, and a lot of the restaurants had, uh, have opened again. You know, they've been doing eat out to help out and all that. And uh, but this was a Friday, uh, and people were out and about, but you know, it didn't have that that buzz. And I've got a friend who has a little open air bar there, which is why I chose this because it's outside, uh, called the Hop Locker, and it's spe- it sells craft beer, and it's all from small uh, mm-hmm. breweries uh, around the UK. So I settled in, and and you know, out outside his stand, and just had some some distance pints i met a couple of friends um because they're leaving they're going to new zealand everyone's leaving everyone's bailing out of london that's what's going to happen now but it but just doing mm-hmm. that and then um getting the train home and i you know got home at like 10 not too late um and uh, it just felt nice to have been out and you know you i woke up in the morning thinking you know i feel a bit chip more chipper today because i i did get out and you know Get, got those endorphins going from from seeing a couple of people but i'm still at the back of my mind uh always on on guard and uh just trying to be just looking out for each other that's what it is because that's that's what that's why we've got to be good with these restrictions just to make sure everyone's okay so well, yeah sorry no short no short answers to any mm. of your questions tonight <laughs> <laughs> well you can tell you um you're well, you're well versed into doing this, so it it makes a change. Mm. So it's nice. Um, yeah, it, it's very strange times. I mean, whether we'll see a few um, companies go under, it's probably inevitable. Um, but I see you doing um, 
other things which is obviously going to change as well. Um, I saw the Bear Guild was advertising some um, training you yes. were going to do. Yes, so um, I'm a, the British Guild of Beer Writers has been around since the 80s. And it might seem a bit weird to have a British Guild of Beer Writers, but if you look into it, there's a lot of writers' guilds. There's a guild of wine writers, a guild of food writers, a guild of travel writers. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm only mm. in the uh, the beer one, but I'm probably going to join the uh, the food one as well. Um, and the the idea of the guilds is they pr- promote members' work and promote the medium um, uh, of these sort of specialist uh, writing. Uh, areas and the the guild I'm, i've actually just joined the board the committee uh, it's called a board of directors because it's set up as a company but it's, it's it's a committee and i was on it before when i just started getting into beer writing and i've had a few years away so um i'm really uh looking forward to being a bit more proactive in in, in what it's doing but the photography thing so i it's the second time i've done a photography course uh for members the first one was very much sort of an introduction mm-hmm. to photography and i talked a lot about my approach but also my sort of my philosophy of photography and it was good but but the feedback was people wanted a bit more of a hands-on thing so um and so i've Mm -hmm. i've said i'm not doing i'm not going to answer your questions on taking photos with your smartphones or anything like that we're going to concentrate on on proper equipment um and then but the real focus will be on uh on the approach to to shoots what you want to get out of it um and and how you're going to deal with the edit looking at beer specifically so um one of the questions mm-hmm. i got was was uh not everyone wants to take reportage photography like how do you make a good photo how do you make beer stand out in the glass um you know how do you make a pint of beer look appealing and not everyone has access to mm-hmm. i mean i've just got getting started with light box photography and that sort of thing just because i've got clients who i do more on location stuff saying can we send you a couple of things to do some clean product shots for us so you know that's 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 yeah. learning learning on the job because you know very rarely are you in a position where you can afford to turn down work when you do it for a living um and so that's been yeah. that's been that's been a bit fun i've got a really interesting job tomorrow actually um uh, a brewery in manchester called marble have got a couple of beers coming out and they uh they want me to take the photos that will be used for the labels and they've got lots of fruit in them, these beers. So I have to go to my green grocers tomorrow morning and buy four pineapples <laughs> to, cho- to chop up for a pineapple <laughs> beer um, and, and try and make that into sort of a, an appealing uh, label. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how that's going to go, but it'll be, I'm going to make a lot of mess uh, chopping up fruit in my kitchen tomorrow. Um, but to, uh, Coming coming back to this uh this thing this talk I'm doing uh next month for the the Guild of Beer Writers is yeah it's focusing on bringing considering beer photography specifically and and in line with editorial so with your writing how it fits in and uh also then making sure that the photos are as good as they can be so there'll be a lot of talk about like my my post production techniques which aren't maybe sort of classically trained photography production techniques but certain things i've learned through being a specialist photographer that mostly just takes photos of beer and and that that really make uh, images these sort of images pop and and make them you know you know how to make a someone be able to reach into a photo and feel like they could almost drink it that's that's a really satisfying feeling when you can Mm -hmm. produce an image that does that and it's also you know when you're in a brewery you, you don't always have great lighting and and the conditions are difficult so part of part of it will be like you know you know i'm very very lucky with a lot of the equipment i use a lot of very wide aperture prime lenses that that you know work really well in low light um i'm a big fan of, of the yeah. sony a7 mirrorless cameras uh for 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 shooting in difficult circumstances and also being very light and portable when you're, when you're walking around a brewery all day and it's a long, long day it's a bit easier on the wrists. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so that kind of thing, uh, I try, you know, I, I, just cause I use those doesn't mean they're the only thing that works really well. There's a lot, lot, lot of brands. I'm not particularly tied to any brand, but, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think that I think that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, the the other thing, uh, obviously, on top of your photography is this mm. podcasting. So, I'd listened to uh, an episode of Pellicle, and I'd also listened to uh, an old one you did with um, uh, Chosen. Oh, Brew. yeah. So I was a guest on that one. That was that was a lot of that that was a lot of mm. fun. Uh, I got to talk about sort of my six desert island beers. That was that was a really interesting mm. show to be a part of. Yeah, I think what I got from these two was um, Chosen Brew. He was talking about Northern Pride. Mm. That seemed to be the main mm. thing for me. He was saying there's a definitely a difference between the north of um, the UK and the south. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so so I, I, I run my own podcast, uh, Pellicle Magazine. Um, if you want to read the magazine, by the way, pellicalemag.com. But there is a podcast as well. We've, and I've done about 14 episodes. Um, and I want to do – I started doing my own podcast just because um, – and we were talking about this before we started recording, weren't we? Where I said, where I said um, mm. it's about reaching a wider audience. and Not everyone has the time to read stuff. As much as I'd like them to, it's not reality. But podcasts, you can have it on when you're driving, when you're out for a jog, when you're at work. You know, they're they're very they're accessible in different situations. So um, it was very important to me to make sure that the content we made at Pellicle was able to reach as wide an audience as possible. Um, so if you you can find the Pellicle podcast if you search for the Pellicle podcast on pretty much anything Apple, Spotify. Um, I've I've tried to make it everywhere, so it should be. Um, okay. But um, the Chosen Brews one was interesting because it's not my podcast. Uh, it was it's an it's a chap from Liverpool, but he's based uh, in Australia. Um, and and he, which is the great thing about podcasting, you know, we're doing this online. You, you can do it from anywhere, really. Uh, the, my decision is that I'm going to continue mine when I can do them in person, because uh, I, that's just that's just it means I can put it on hold for a little while. But that's something I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up uh, in in a few weeks or months whenever people start to feel comfortable to do that again. Uh, I'll have to get some sanitizing spray for my microphones, of course. Um, but um, yeah. no, he he asked me to pick six beers, and honestly, actually, if he if he asked me again, I'd pick six different beers. A co- couple of the breweries in that episode have done have done some things that I'm not particularly pleased with, so I'm I wouldn't recommend their beers at the moment. Um, but uh, that's such is the nature of the industry. Um, but in terms of what you're coming back to, Northern Pride is, and I say this as a Londoner, as a proud Londoner. You know, I was born in Lincoln, and I'm I'm proud to be from lincoln and i'm still a passionate lincoln city football club supporter we were lo- we were losing one nil mm-hmm. before uh before i came on this podcast i haven't checked <laughs> what the score was but um uh so as, as i say this as a proud london that, that when i visit the north and I, you know in, in my work and i go to to leeds and I go to Manchester and I go to small, I was in Macclesfield uh, at the beginning of March, right before this all went mad. And I was in, I was in Liverpool the week after that. In fact, coming back to, yes, I had COVID. I was in Liverpool for a beer conference the same time as uh, uh, many thousands of people from Madrid were there to see a certain football match. Uh, and who I might've been staying oh. in the same hotel as many of them, which would explain why a couple of days later I got very poorly. Um, but um, that's besides the point. So, you know, I spend a lot of time traveling to to the north and there's a different attitude to pubs and beer up there. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot more pride uh, because um, and I'm I'm culpable in this. You know, the, the media, the beer media is so heavily based in London and it's not just beer. It's, it's everything really that the north doesn't get uh, talked about in the same same way. So that's that that puts people in a position of being you know ad- everyone's an advocate for their stuff and i always used to think it was a bit of north south divide and i you know i i love i love the south i love going to the, the south down south of london i've got a friend with a brewery in southampton uh, i was in cornwall at the end of last year it's great but there's a different attitude up north of, and which i don't know i can't quite put my finger on it ask me again in a couple of months when i've been living in manchester for for a month <laughs> And and I'll probably be able to give you a better answer, but it's it's just it's a, it's a feeling, and it's great. What something I really like 
because a lot of people think that because of the internet and because of travel and because of trains that can take you all over the country in a couple of hours, we've lost a lot of regionality. And I don't think that's true. And I actually think the way the world is now, and you know, it's a difficult time. It's as a lot of the regionality is 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 coming out through that pride and that support. If you're supporting local, you're going to create that that regional difference in terms of like like food. Like bit, there's a great example in beer. And I don't know who drinks sparkled beer or uh, sparkle real ale in a pub where they pull the beer on cask on hand pull through a through a nozzle called a sparkler, which gives a smaller bubbles and a tight, creamy head. And in the south, so the south has a reputation mm. for 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 beer with no head. And I have I have seen that. It's not really the truth. If in a good pub, they'll serve you a proper beer, but not through a sparkler. In the north, uh, they they serve beer. Uh, through through this nozzle which gives it a much sort of bigger creamier head and smaller bubbles which means you can take big gulps and, and it's less gassy and i love it uh you know it, it's it's a little thing it causes such such a divide in in the beer world and i actually quite enjoy stoking the fire a bit because it's a bit of fun you know poking the wasp's nest on some on an argument over a little plastic nozzle but that the, what i find is um <laughs> Like the, 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 there's a lot of pride in the serve uh, in in the north. I guess the other thing is because of my, you know, it's all about perspective. And I live in London, and so much of what people think of hmm. as London is is you know the West End uh, or the South Bank where I was. Um, that is, people work there and people do live there, uh, but my, you know, it's not really a reflection of what London is actually like. Where I live in in Crouch End in North London, it's very quiet. There's no cars going past. There's, it's 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 pretty quiet. It's it's very different uh, experience to to all that. So I think when people think of London, it's it's not quite as it's not quite what people uh, think, despite it being on the doorstep. But because of that, a lot of these sort of um, pubs in these in central, in, you know, around Oxford Street they're not really a reflection of like the best there are some really good examples but not the really reflection of the best of london what london has to offer um so uh and i think because of that there's less pride there because it's just serving a function rather than something to be proud of if that if that makes sense so it, so we'll find out mm. we'll find out in a, in a in a couple of months time i'll have I'll have started to get my feet under the table in Manchester and I'll be able to really see if what I believe on my visits is, is the truth. Yeah. That would be um, an interesting article then, isn't it? Northern pride. We're through the formal part of the interview, Mm -hmm. Matthew. And what I like to do is have a little bit of fun and ask my guests some silly random questions. I love silly random questions. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, that's good. So what I'll do is I'll start you off on a very mm. easy one. So what's your biggest disappointment in photography? Oh, my biggest disappointment. Every single overexposed photo I've ever taken. Um, <laughs> no, um, oh, I'm trying to think of a very specific example. Um, I went to meet oh, a very prominent brewery owner, and I had – half an hour interview and then get some photos and i -hmm. had a lot of beer during the interview and i didn't take a single in focus shot of this uh brewery owner and uh because i was sort of too busy chatting away you know like from this podcast i like to talk and i'd grabbed a few shots and and none of them were in focus and i had to i think i for the article i had to go back to the press team and say can you provide me with some photography because mine didn't come out so, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, that, uh, that taught me to always put it in burst mode when I'm taking portraits and check them before I, before I, uh, go <laughs> home. So, um, yeah, um, I guess that's it. But the, yeah, the other thing is every time I take a really overexposed, washed out picture of us, of, of the sky, that, that's, that, that's no, no amount of editing can save. Mm. Well, as a film shooter, you don't need to know how many weird and wonderful combinations of black and pure white photos yes. I've got. So. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. 
Um, okay, no, I like that. So when will we start using the term hit women or hit people instead of hit men? Oh, in terms of, in terms of like assassinations <laughs> yeah uh, i don't i don't know that you did say these are going to be random questions and you've absolutely absolutely yeah. got me i'm sure there are I'm, i have to say uh the uh the the industry of of offing people is not one i'm i'm up to date with um and oh, okay. uh i i don't I don't know. Uh, hit people. I mean, we'd, uh, to bring this back to beer, people, you know, you, you don't use the term um, barmaid or, or, or waitress. It's it's bartender or, or just server or, or wait staff. Um, so okay, um, maybe hit tender um, to, to, to use a bartender term. I don't know. Kill tender. Let's. You know, I don't know. It's it, it's uh, <laughs> um uh yeah absolutely flummoxed me with that one okay. so um but, no, you know, okay, so okay. Gets, <laughs> hit me with the next one <laughs> okay so how would you ban daydreaming oh, um lobotomies just a steel spike just a steel spike ah. inserted through the nose i mean it, you know if you uh, spend enough time scrolling through social media you're basically self lobotomizing yourself anyway these days so uh, uh speed speed it up with a with a short sharp spike to the frontal lobe and uh, drift into uh, endless oblivion so that could be the next marketing thing by yeah, instagram just just inserts put att- attach the Free spike to the front of your phone and then just nod vigorously uh instead of double tapping and enhance your experience immediately <laughs> literally it. to the to the frontal <laughs> lobe <laughs> okay i like that um when you reach heaven you get to trade the kudos and karma you've earned all your life into a reward what will be your reward Oh, a hamburger! <laughs> just a really good cheese, just a really good cheeseburger, uh, and if I'm lucky, a nice pint of American West Coast IPA to go with it. That that's it. If, if if I get one last thing, that's it. All the good you can do. Just a really nice, juicy cheeseburger, uh, and and a pint of beer. That's that's it, and that's it. I, I'm done. Nothing nothing left to live for. <laughs> Well, to be fair, you've made it to the main place there you go. as well. So, yeah, so mm. it's double bonus. Okay, no, I like that. Um, you come home and find a spider ironing, a shark washing up, and an octopus playing your guitar. Which would scare you the most? Uh, probably the octopus, because o- the octopus is a way more intelligent than... than uh... Than, than you think and mm. uh, 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 uh the, well than most people think and i do have a few nice guitars I, I used to be quite into my i used to work in the musical instrument industry and if i if i saw a saw an octopus on my fender telecaster uh it, a it'd probably be a lot better than me and that would scare me uh well no it wouldn't really because i'm not that good but uh yeah i think that would be that would be the biggest shock i mean the, sh- the shark and the spider I mean, I just think, well, that's it. But with the octopus, would genuinely be like a a, a a very scary moment. I nearly, I nearly swore there. I'm not sure I'm, <laughs> but but um, <laughs> yeah, the octopus. Okay, I like that. Um, for your final one, so <clears throat> you get to either punch, give a present, or have a pint with each of the following. So you've got. Matthew the Apostle, mm. Matthew Broderick, or Matt Smith, as, as in Doctor, the Doctor Who, Who's Matt, Matt Smith, Smith and Doctor. Uh, so, so punch, uh, punch present or pint, punch present or pint. Ah, oh. well, mm. do you know what? This is uh, this is very very challenging. Uh, I'm, I'm having a quick bit of deliberation uh here so um can you really punch someone with a biblical I'd, figure well i i'd have a pint with matthew the apostle um because okay. uh 
uh, you know that there's he, he was a, he was a, a tax man, wasn't he? So uh, he could probably help me with my accounts. Um, so I want to keep him sweet. Um, I would uh, would give a present to uh, Matthew Broderick uh, for his fabulous work okay. in uh, hmm. Ferris Bueller's Day Off and the criminally underrated Inspector yeah. Gadget. Um, and unfortunately, this yeah. means uh, I'd have to uh, punch Matt Smith uh, for being less good at being the Doctor than David Tennant. Uh, uh, oh, or, okay. or just being um, wildly young and successful. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I, <laughs> I'm not much. Of, not I'm much not of bitter a puncher, at all. But I'm afraid uh, he's just drawn. It's just a case of drawing the short, short straw there. So he's uh, he's gonna gonna get a smiting. Okay, I like that. Well, thank you so much for going through that. That, that was a very different that. experience for me. So thank you. That was, uh, but I'm still thinking about the the the, the hit man, hit women question. It's a, it's, it's going to keep me awake all night. <laughs> Just in case it comes Absolutely. up in a pub quiz. Yeah. No, that's cool. So do you want to just remind everybody where they can check out um, yes, your uh, work? Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, please check out Pellicle magazine. Um, you can find us at www.pellicalemag.com. Um, and you, we're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at Pellicle Mag. And if you want to follow me personally uh, on Twitter and Instagram, my username is at Total Curtis. So Curtis is my surname. And Total Ales was the first name of my name of my first beer blog, so that's where Total Curtis comes from. Uh, so you can find me on there, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's rarely a moment uh, I'm not on Twitter, chatting away, uh, and uh, you can uh, just continue the conversation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm always up for it. No, that's cool. Thank you for that. And the last thing I always do with my guests, um, I do this paid mm-hmm. forward scheme. Is there anyone you think would like to come on to the show? Um, someone who's maybe from a different genre, um, someone maybe you admire, a friend or something? Um, let me have a quick think. Um, you did put this in the mm. in, in your briefing, and I uh, I was like, ah, who, and I, I was having a thing, and I'm trying to think of a really um, interesting person. So um i'm gonna think think of a, a photographer friend of mine in yorkshire actually called a guy, um a guy called mark newton and i can send you his details okay um so mark newton is a is a fantastic photographer he's done some stuff with us at pellicle um and i'm a i'm a big okay. fan uh of his i mean he's an incredible photographer and if you um Go on to Pellicle. There's a there's a lovely uh, story about Appleton's butchers in Harrogate in Yorkshire in well, Ripon, and they make amazing mm. pork pies. And the photos there, you will you'll you'll be so hungry after seeing them. He's he's ridiculously talented. So thinking about photography, I think he's he's um, he deserves to be a lot more well known because for his for his talents. And he's done a few bits for us at Pellicle, and, we'll, and, and long may that continue. So uh, yeah, Mark Newton. Oh, that's nice. No, that's cool. Well, thank you so much for, um, for that, Matthew. That sounds a very interesting prospect. Um, it's been really nice talking to you uh, about one of my favourite subjects. Great. Likewise, really thanks so much for having me on, Andrew. And uh, uh, may you enjoy many uh, delicious new beers. Mm. Well, I hope I'll get some advice off you, that's for Excellent. sure. Excellent. I'm always here for beer advice. Yeah. No problem. You take care. Cheers.